Alexander, but I see you've all introduced yourself <laughs> and he has introduced himself to you. But let's give him a rousing garden early. <laughs> That's my introduction? That's your introduction. <laughs> All the money I spent on education, yes. children, right. and that's my introduction. Right. I'll take it. <laughs> I'm giving you the time to speak. Okay. Uh, briefly, uh, I am really impressed. We were scheduled, and this, by the way, is my associate, actually my boss in a way. Uh, this is Tristan Schultz. He is the, uh, we have a firm called um, Arrowhead Institute, and when you, well, you, did you think you want to say about the firm or, or anything? No, good. Okay. <laughs> so we're pleased, and we're supposed to schedule to go to Virginia, because the birthplace for Archer Alexander is Rockbridge, Virginia. Secondly, his birthday is in 1816 and October 30th they had installation of the professorship for Archer Alexander. Now this is the, the whole Washington University and the Chancellor they didn't want to they called it he was born in 1800s because they were not sure what his date is. Gladys and I are positive <laughs> because if you go to the Provost Marshal, they will have a letter, and I got a copy of it, and the letter states he was 47 years old and 47 from 63 gives you 1860. It also says he is five foot eight. And what else does it say on that letter? And that free him as to October, excuse me, I said October, February, no. What date does that letter say he is free, Gladys? <laughs> March 30th, 1863. Because the title of the book says, Archer Alexander, From Slavery to Freedom, March 30th, 1863. This has become, or has, been obsession. And I'm going to give you a little background to lead you up to what started it off, and the triumphs and the failures of getting the information. Number one, today is Martin Luther King's Day. I did a, yes, you can clap. Uh, I did a program for public television in 18, uh, 60, excuse me, 1983. That makes the March on Washington Howell 20 year anniversary. And I did uh, the program because when I'm introduced to the black community, they won't talk about my degrees, they won't talk about that I worked on ALSAP, the Powell Lunar Surface Experimental Package, my first degree is engineering. They talk about the March on Washington. And I was an organizer. Now you've heard about the presenters. There's four areas to it. The presenters, the ones who spoke that day, the producers, and the planners. I, at the age of 19, met Dr. King when he was debating an individual about 
the church getting involved. And he makes that famous line. I want the church to become the headlights in the civil rights rather than the taillights. And I was there. And as we walk through, he reaches down. There's, uh, there's about 30 of us, and we're walking through to the fairground. And he reaches down in this dust. We're at Ohio State going to the, uh, the bleachers. And he picks up a penny or a coin. To me, that was a sign. He was seeing things others did not see. I don't know how many people have walked over that. So from that, I got active, because I was inspired. He was not like Minerva. In the Greek mythology, Minerva, what happens to her? She was a wise lady. She was a very, and she popped out of her father's head. He was going to go to war. And he said, I need a leader to help me in war. And he's thinking hard about it. And in Greek mythology, she pops out of his head, fully armed with a strategy of what to do. Well, Dr. King did not, did not, he evolved. And if you really want to understand him, and unfortunately they're getting away from the scholarship of it, you start off with his father, who taught him some things from a very privileged family in Atlanta. And then he would talk about Benjamin, Dr. Benjamin May. You know who Benjamin May is? Say it, Bob. Benjamin May was the president. Oh, no. Not more than the pre president of Morehouse College. Right. And then there's a guy named Thurman who made a big impact on Dr. King. But I'm going to tell you something that most people don't know. Most of the people that surrounded Dr. King were, I wouldn't say, but they were his lieutenants and they idolized him, they offered him loyalty. But whenever he had a problem, there's one person he would turn to for advice or money. Does anyone know who that person was? It was Walter Ruther. There's no coincidence that you'll see them linked arm together. Matter of fact, in the Birmingham jail situation, it was Walter Ruther that bailed King and most of the young people out. $180,000. Later, when they're doing the march in Washington, he supplied 200 UAW workers to work on the march in Washington. Plus, when Dr. King wrote the first draft of I Have a Speech, it was in the office of the UAW office. I say that because I was a UAW employee at that time, and I know what happened. I was there for the briefing. And when, the, when they decided they need a loudspeaker system, who, who furnished it? Walter Ruther for $160,000. He was friends with the Kennedys and the Roosevelt's, et cetera, et cetera. The point I'm making is the March on Washington is the greatest example of this country worldwide. As some of you know, I taught in Scotland for a while. They mentioned that. Only 15% of the participants came from the South. 70% came from this kind of area. It was America saying we had enough that changed. Now, he had a great speech. Unfortunately, our young people only think it's a couple of things. It's Rosa Parks, Dr. King, and I have a dream. But we did not come 250,000 strong knowing he's going to make that speech. We're already there. And they don't talk about the pledge that was made. I was going to go back to school, and at the end of that day, they made a pledge. And the pledge was, you will go back to your communities, and you will try to do something about 
the situation. And I'm only going to end it this way, because I want to talk about our friend, Arch Alexander. The greatest civil rights worker of them all was his wife. She was active before they met and after he died. The reason we have this day was her work. And she went for 40 years. And what's more important is she was able to convey and create the legacy he has today. Because his legacy was down at that time. And the first two states was Connecticut and Massachusetts to pass what we have today. And uh, that's all I have to say. It's a wonderful expression that we see in other parts of the world. They talk about that. But the person who helped pass the Civil Rights Bill is a guy called Norman Rockwell. Does anyone know why I say that? You? I'm an old professor, so I point, you know, at times. <laughs> they say it because in March, seven months after the March on Washington, there was a, in Look Magazine, there's a little black girl being escorted by four husky and it's called the Ruby Bridges painting, but that's not the real name of the painting. It's it's time. It's time. Uh, it's time we do something, or something is the true, true title. Norma Rockwell suddenly, Americans, middle Americans, opened their magazine and said, "This is wrong." But she has to be escorted to go to school. Now I was president of NAACP in my local area. That week I got nine calls. You get one or two a month to go somewhere and speak. And so finally I said, what's going on? And the woman says, I can't stand after seeing that picture. So in my pantheon of heroes, civil rights, I add Norman Rockwell. He had six the readership for Look Magazine was six million, and it had multiple. And people weren't prepared when they looked at it, and they looked at it and said, we gotta change this. So America is about that. And now, can I move on? But thank you for Martin Luther King Day, the best celebration I could think of to see this many people. Miss can be ridiculous. And one of the myths is that Americans do not like to discuss slavery. The blacks are ashamed by, of it, and the whites want to forget it. But yet, it's, if you go to the history books, it's uh, books done by it, movies done by it, you find it over and over again. Four million Americans were released, freed, in January 1st, 1963. And one of those Americans was Archer Alexander. And each has their story as to how they went from slavery to freedom. But Archer is the one person that has it documented. Elliot, William Greenleaf Elliot, a very dynamic man, was responsible for the recapture back from slave catchers of Archer Alexander. Now, let me give you the story very quickly overall. Our book is, has two volumes. First volume is 552 pages. It reflected what the context, what we have allowed to happen is for people to write about those days with a broad brush. 
And it was as different from state to state, from house to house, from crop to crop, as you can imagine. In this area, and I'm really glad the Pittmans are here, because it was the fight between David and Richard Pittman and John Fremont, the Pathfinder. They wanted to prove that you were a Southern sympathizer. And once they do that, they then can take your, they can use that as protection for Archer Alexander. So if you go into the Provost Marshal, you will see he was called in two or three times. And they came up with this scheme out of Washington. Lincoln came up and they said, we will have everybody if we want to find out who they are, we ask them to take a vow that they support the federal government. If you want to get wedding, married, they would ask you, do you support before the proceeding? If you wouldn't get your mail, it was called, the process was called the vow. This is a, a nice chapter in there. And the key of it is called swallowing the dog. Has anyone ever heard that phrase before? Pittman, strong, they own everything. You know that, don't you? Are you still own everything? <laughs> I wait. I know they played the, piano, uh, the violin. He's a great violin player. Am I not right, sir? You're right. He, him and his sons, own Archer, and, we'll, and I'm getting ahead of the story because I'll tell you how Archer became his property. Archer, as I mentioned, was born in Virginia. He was born the son of a very prominent family, the Alexander family, the Archibald Alexander family, the same family that started Princeton. At that time, it was called New Jersey. His mother was Sally, S-A-L-L-E-Y. She was a cook for the Reeds. The Reeds, the Campbells, and the Alexanders all left Ireland to come to America in 1747. They first settled in Philadelphia, and then from that they went to the Rock of the Virginia area. At the age of 12, he made the first journey to Missouri with John B. Alexander, who was a revolutionary soldier. And the one way that you know that you can get a pension, when you go to a group, you better be scarred. You have to have something wrong with a scar or whatever. And if you check the history books on pensions, that's the way you, you qualify your, for your pension. You show your arm, say I was in the war. But just don't go in and say I want a pension. So he was a war veteran, and his son, James H. Alexander, was also a veteran. So he was 12 years old when he first made the trip. And it was in 1828. James Alexander, he was to go ahead first and scout out the land. And they were to follow a year later. And that's one of the papers you have for the Campbells is when they come from uh, Lexington was 20, 1829, the year after. John dies. He's buried here. And his son, James, is buried here. And the wife is buried here. But no, the wife is not. Because she goes back. Her body, she dies here. But she goes back to Virginia. And you know who takes her back to Virginia? Archer Alexander. After being here for eight years, they said, we want to take it back to the Presbyterian, and we have the records where she was reburied, 
as well as her husband. And Archer goes back. They come to him and say, will you take the children back? Because they had made a promise of Nancy McClure on her deathbed that the children would go back east to be educated. So Archer takes them back. And that's where, although he has been raised as a member of the Alexander family, he is sold for the first time to pay for the education of those children. He's there, now back in Virginia. He's now part of the Farrell family, F-E-R-R-E-L-L. -L -L. And things go bad for them, and they decide to join the rest in this wonderful area of the world. And when you read some of the descriptions that people would say, what did Boone say about this area? He said, yeah, Mother Nature, you just scratch her side and it just blooms out with food. And they talk. And then we have the areas and uh, the sections that you will love when we talk about this locale. It was called the Eden. Oh, you know that already, right? She says, yes. Of the Midwest. So now he's in Virginia as a slave. He comes back again with Thorell family. And while he's here, their family had trouble and they decide to go to Louisiana. And that's when he is sold in 1844 to your family, the Pittman family. But the story is about, I don't see, we don't have one here. Uh, the story is about the relationship between William Greenleaf Elliott and Archer. For 16 years, they become very good friends. I know more about William Greenleaf Elliott, I hate to say this, than anybody in the world. I visited every. I read everything he has done. I visited nine members of his current family, and what's more important, I read the correspondence. Some are writing family; they're a very educated family. <coughs> the Elliots are the one responsible for Harvard University. T. S. Eliot, the poet, that's his grandfather, and he was a little guy. As a matter of fact, the whole family was little. <laughs> and the story is that the judge of the family was taking some pictures with normal sized persons and they said to the judge, how do you feel a little guy like you with big men like us? He said, like a shiny penny among, uh, pin a shiny ni a dime among pennies. <laughs> William Greenleaf, as you know, had, when we don't know, had 14 children, which nine died. He built the biggest church in St. Louis. And while he administered other people and brought them peace and calm, Archer brought him peace and calm. I learned about, they had every, uh, they call a parade of the state banquet. It had everything, uh, Boston beans, chicken peak, uh, chicken, something this, Idaho this, and she, they would have it because they were very powerful people and they learned you make friends. So they would invite on July 4th. And I have the actual story, Archer wore gloves. He didn't want to mess up his hands. Archer was a dude in a little ways. <laughs> and there's a story where Archer is led, and I got the actual people of that family, there's a, a young man called, named Comstock, who also worked for the Elliots, and he's led into to get hired. 
And uh, the mother says, oh, yes, we need you. He says, go report to him. We got to get ready for this picnic. And he says, ma'am, this is that quote. I seen a dog climb a tree, but I never seen a <clears throat> with gloves on. <laughs> and there's a story how they became involved as friends. In his book, he said, Archer is the finest Christian he ever met. So here is my challenge. First of all, I have to prove that I'm related to him. Secondly, did, it, did William Greenleaf really mean that, or was this a do-gooder just si saying something? Thirdly, the story. The story occurred 20 years after it, it, the escape happened, where he left with, and recaptured back into the Elliott family. And then he goes into Illinois and lives there for two or three years. And his wife and him come back. And she accidentally dies, mysteriously, in the book. Now here where you must understand, I was in Cambridge, and I was uh, doing something with Thomas Clarkson, who abolished slavery. And they thought it would be cute, American, black, you know, beneficiary, you'd be with the keynote speaker. And when I was doing the speaking, I discovered the true legacy that we have. It does not just include our Frederick Douglass and other great Americans. It includes other people who decide to do something about it. So there's a section on that. And here's how I got started. I was asked to do a TV show, public TV, you can get it, it's May 6th, 1985. And on that TV show, they had the mayor of Chicago, Mayor Barry, who just died, Gary Hatcher, the mayor, uh, Thurman Marshall, the mayor. I was the only non-politician, because I had done the other show on the March in Washington. In, 19, you know, the 20, in 1983. And then they asked me a question, they went around the table and they said, what is a challenge for the new urban black leader? And I said, to change protest, personality, and power into performance and progress. I use a bunch of P's and about three weeks later, and there's a, it's called allegory, isn't that correct? Alliteration. Say it. Alliteration. Alliteration. Is when you use one initial, all right? I get this call, and it said it's the White House. And it was one of the person of the panel, Bill Keyes, who says, we've got to make a decision on South Africa, whether to give them sanctions or not, or the principles of Leon Sullivan. Does anyone know who he is? He sat on the board of General Motors and he said, he came with the principles, he said his argument was it's better to keep American co companies in South Africa and then they can lead the way and show them how to do it. So we're trying to, as a group, six of us, and we visit and I got the story, I mean, it's, I write up, going to South Africa, you got an honorary slip. This is, I'm an honorary white person, which meant if I go to the hospital, I can go to any hospital. I, that's me going to Soweto and a few other places, Soweto. But the key is, there, there's a luncheon by the Chancellor of Cape Town University. And in that luncheon, there was one black African. And he is a son of a river of the uh, rain queen, the most powerful chieftain of them all. She is a woman. She can take liberties with any man she wants. He never marries. 
because they felt that she is responsible for rain. And her, one of her offsprings was there. This, and he said he liked to talk to me, he comes to my room, and that's where he tells me, how dare you? You come over here and tell us how to run our country. You of a jackal and I. You with no family. And I said, wait a minute. I got family, I got Archer Alexander. But I gotta prove it. And that is what the race, what the quest was about. I proved it. Categorically. The writer of the book was not William Greenleaf Elliott. It was Jesse Benton Fremont, a former wife. She did the same thing with her husband when she created Kit Carson. You know, he was a bestseller. And what they did is they had the annual report. Elliot put it together and they said, well, you gotta push it. And he gave it to his publisher, nothing. Nothing but numbers. Put some spice in it. He writes, and she says, send me the information. And if you go to the historical society here, there's a five page transmittal letter that shows Pittman and it also shows that he just lived in Virginia and the story of Archer Alexander. Archer Alexander, the story was created 20 years after because three things were happening. One, the reconstruction period is coming in and some people are saying, sit on back to slavery. But the most important thing is her husband, General Fremont, was looking for a position and she wanted to remind everyone he was the first one with the Emancipation Proclamation. So she wanted that. Then she wanted to store how bad slavery was. And Judge, is a Judge Bart, what's his name? Bart Bates. He has a story in here about his. And that was the purpose. It was a piece of propaganda so other people could be remembered how wonderful her husband was and so he could run for position again. That was the number one reason it was written. You can see it and in uh, volume two of our book. We have every page to explain everything and how it occurred. Now, I'll take questions. The key is the book. I've had it reviewed by, uh, I'm, I'm humbled. The book is not just about Archer Alexander. It's about slavery, but in a different concept. There's 2,300 stories of the WPA done on slaves. And most of those stories were incidents. In my book, you hear about the man who carried his wife, had a slave carry his wife in a wheelbarrow for six months. She had died. But the slaves know how she died. You hear about the man who thought he was going to die and had a funeral every year and he'd invite the slaves in. It took him 16 years to die, but they would be there. But see, here's the point. The slaves had their own system. And they, they were, there's some signals, and we go into some of the slave history and the signals. They were thinking something. How many of you have dogs? How many got horses? All right. Well, the point of it is, if your dog or horse was smarter than you, <laughs> and when, you're, when the dog is, you're petting a dog, and the dog is probably saying, right, why don't you leave me alone? <laughs> Or the dog is saying, you look terrible out of your clothes. 
This is what slaves were thinking. <laughs> they had a system of network for over 200 years. When the masters went to bed, they would meet. And they had riddles. And they were educated. And I have been in uh, Africa a few times and I've talked. I gather these stories. They had the system in the beginning of the first book, the foreword, it says, uh, when I was at Cambridge, they had some uh, experts on, well, they call themselves experts, and I accept them as experts. And he said, the difference is between Amer African in Africa and African in America. The one in Africa is taught to pass on the stories. We are storytellers. And the one here are taught to forget of the slavery. And that is one of the themes. There's one section of the book I love. It's called Loss of Imagination. Uh, Tristan, did you read, is that the one you read? Which part, is, is that the one you like? I did not read that chapter actually. Right, because, <laughs> well see, first of all. No, the, the one that I did read, that, that I did read. I think it was chapter 23 and chapter what was that? What was that on? Uh, chapter, golly, chapter three was, uh, well, I don't want to give it away. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can give it some away. Did you enjoy it? You're going to love, I love books, and you're going to love this. Now, what we're going to do, we will sign hard copies. What's the discount for this group? Only this group. What's the discount? 30%. 30%? I thought it was 20%. i will talk to you later. <laughs> There's two volumes. 564 in the first volume, and roughly about 280. So it's about 900 pages. The second, because I'm academic, you'll see in the first book, I have just Errol Alexander. On the second book, it's Errol Alexander, PhD. And in the second one, it justifies every point. But the first one, I want you to read it. It's a good read. Uh, how much time do I have? Is this about, right? How much time? Five minutes? All night. Oh, no, 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 not all night. <laughs> Two things. I'm going to tell you some things you don't know. Who is the first African-American born in this country? His name, you're knowledgeable, whoever you are, so I keep going to <laughs> Who is this? What's his name? I bet Bob doesn't know. His name is William Tucker. He was born in 1624 at Jamestown. He is the first Christian because that is from when he was Chris, by, uh, after the founder, William Tucker. But two Africans, and they were not slaves. They were indentured servants at that time. There's 19 on the book, on the boat treasure. The Tucker whole curse. If I was going to cuss him as a slave, I would say, may you go to a plantation where they grow rice? <laughs> the boss is mean. The wife is, and they have a lot of children. That's the worst situation you can be on a slave. <laughs> or if you were Caesar, who lived to be 115 years old, and by the way, you can check out all these names. When they used to be before 1870, when you reach 100 years old and a slave, you're allowed to have two names. And in the 1860 census, there is 1,560 slaves that were 100 years old or older. So they came to Caesar, who was considered the last fugitive slave in New York. A, a slave, not fugitive, but slave in New York. And he says, Caesar, you're, you're going to be a hundred. You're going to have two names. And he says, hell, for a hundred years, it'll work with one name. I don't need two names. 
Caesar ran. He was a beautiful looking man. Caesar ran this family and he took the name. He died after 115 years old. I can get, there's some stories in this book that's going to tear your heart out. Because I write what they think. You know the difference between a movie, acting, and a novel? And I'm just, you're, are you a professor? No. Okay. <laughs> Does anyone know? Please, anyone. What about it? What's the difference? The difference is... You use your imagination. Well, you use your imagination, but what else? In a book, I can tell what the person is thinking. I can say, let's say it's a, a young man, he says, oh, what a beautiful woman she is, in the mind. But in theater, you either have to act it or show it. But in a book, you can think, or you can say, I hate this guy. And I have a scene where the slave trader goes in uh, to Virginia and he deals with a, a dealer and he hates the dealer. He doesn't like the way he looks because, the the de you know, they hate each other but they're necessary evils. And in the book, he is thinking, I hate this guy. And he gives reasons. That's the big difference in a book or a novel or in one of the other issues about whether this is a novel or not. The four Gospels. What, what, do you know the four Gospels? Wait a minute, where's the priest? Matthew, Mark, Matthew. Wait a minute, I want to get the priest. Matthew, Mark, right, there it is. We don't need a priest for that. Okay. Oh, I don't need a, wait a minute. This, oh, what an arrogant group. Oh, we don't need a priest. All right. They wrote about Jesus, right? They never met him. They never met him, but they wrote about him. Is, is that correct? Uh, no, that's all right. That's you, that's correct. Uh, Matthew and John both apostles. So yeah, they yeah but they weren't the writers of the book. No, 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 we're talking the gospel of the book. Maybe we, sh we need yeah. you, by the way, you want to talk anything about that? All right. No, but the point I'm trying to make is... <laughs> thank you, you've been very kind. The point I'm making is, writing about someone who has passed is a great storytelling tradition. And in my family, there's four things that we have to identify. My great-grandfather, the son, grandson of Archer, used to quote Shakespeare. Used to what? Shakespeare. Oh. When he talked, he would say, oh, he has the skull of a lawyer, full of quickening and trickery and whatever. And I used to hear him say that. And I used to say, and only found out later, that was Shakespeare. But he never went to college. How did you learn that? Well, the other issue is, Archer did read. He could read the print. The watch that you receive, that you win in the historical society was given by Archer to, from, to Christian, the son. Because the son taught him how to read. At 54 years old, he became a very literate man. He could have gave the watch to his, to his father, other, he gave it to Christopher. We talk about that, how that develops. And we talk about he lost two wives. We talk about how he lost the two wives and how he was depressed. He said, I can understand one wife, but in the book, they call her Judy, but her real name, she's Julia. This is by census track. She just came over one day. She had a big gap tooth. She loved everybody and did everything. And she argued consistently with William Greenleaf Elliott, the minister. Because she could speak German because she was raised as a slave in a German household. And guess what? 
William Greenleaf Elliott worshipped the Germans. In all the books, he talks about how he loved the Germans. They brought discipline. They brought industry. They brought order to this area. So that's part of it. I'll answer questions for how, how much time? Gladys, five minutes? Between five and ten minutes. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Gladys. <laughs> she act like I'm getting paid by the piece work here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Gladys. I would like to say something about the watch. Okay. Because Errol had that, excuse me, Dr. Alvin. That's okay. No, it's Errol. Go ahead. I had seen it, and he asked if I would go to the art museum and take a picture of it for him and email it to him. So I said, yes, you know. So then my younger sister, she and her husband, they go to the art museum quite often, and they said, well, they take a picture and give it to me, you know, and I said, fine. So I called down to the art museum, and they said, oh, no, no, you don't do that. You, you have to come, you have to sign a paper. Uh -huh. And my gosh, I had to go through so much security, it was unbelievable. <laughs> and we went down three floors on one of their freight elevators. My grandson and I, he had his camera. Your grandson? Your grandson. Yes, okay. and we took a picture of this and the inscription, there's an inscription on the back of the, of the watch that he told us, that he will tell us in his book. So I don't know, but that was quite a, a memorial, memorable day to go there, you know, I just thought we could just walk in. But no, you don't, you sure don't. Uh, I think I got a copy. By the way, this is the original letter, March 30th, that's in your, your archives here. It was 143 years, and thank you Gladys for that. But Gladys, when I, saw, he, he, when I found about the watch, I notified them, they said, well, we can't go down, we can't find it and all that. So I sent Gladys and her son, <laughs> and they got to watch. Let me end this way. There's no other questions? Just comments? Any comments? Okay, go ahead. We don't know who you are yet. I'd like to know about your family, your education, that, that you were not in. I know. You know, and my mother turned over in her grave, too, when she did that. <laughs> My, I have a PhD from the University of Glasgow in Scotland. I go to five countries researching this. I went to Canada, England, Scotland, United States, and Cameroon, because I had a, a DNA done on myself, and I am from the Cameroon. All right? Um, I have eight children, five daughters, three sons. Who's going to say it? You want to say it, Tristan? How many what, my children? 14 grandchildren. All right, but what about their, their degrees? Uh, 17 degrees in total for everyone ages of uh, over 22. 17 degrees from 16 universities. William and Mary, University of Penn, Rutgers, etc. Uh, uh, wonderful one or uh, three, three PhDs and four masters. So if you look up William and Mary, you can see Chloe. If you University of Kentucky, you see my daughter, uh, Mia Diane, White Alexander. Uh, and I use a method of motivation. Uh, they're achievers, but they achieve off each other. They don't achieve off me, and I don't brag about them but they brag on each other. And I had, uh, and with my grandchildren, there's nine of them got high honors. These are in high school, uh, grade school and whatever. And I got a, uh, Julian calls and says, Gramps, I'm now high honor, because I was just honors. <laughs> <laughs> they, that's important to them. And I believe, believe in motivation very much, that you can motivate people to get things accomplished. Is that enough on Alexander family? Did that answer your question? Yes. Five books. This book, one of the reviews I got from, oh, it says Jim Creighton. How many of you remember Weekly Reader in school? <laughs> he was the editor of Weekly Reader. Toughest critic. I sent it to him. And he came back and said, and we got it in one of the books, 
It's the best book, American history book, and remember that's what it is, in this era. But it took 40 some different historical individuals like Gladys. Now Gladys contributed more than average, but in Maryland, uh, they found where Alexander was turned over by the church. By the way, most of the people, uh, Alexander's, they did not believe in slavery. But they would turn the slaves over to the church and they would rent the slaves out. <laughs> it created two or three things. One, it brought income to the church and they made them compete. And secondly, they could say, oh no, we don't believe in slavery. So Archer was uh, turned over through the church on the charge of bastardy from Sally. And that's how, uh, and he was supposed to be there until he was 21. He got sold at the age of 20. If he had made it to 21, he's a free person. Any other questions? Yes. You mentioned uh, Greenleaf. That's right. Founded the first church in this area, mm -hmm. or not this church. Yeah. In this, mm -hmm. And what was it? I'm curious. Uh, it well, <laughs> he was a Unitarian. Okay. And uh, it's still here. It's the first of Massa. Um, you know, M E S S I A H. Messiah. Messiah. Thank you. Because I, I'm tired. You know, I, I missed the, the Seahawks game flying in. <laughs> Tristan, there's only thing he complained about. You know, the game, and they did not have anything on the airplane. And I'm 74. Because someone asked me, who was that you? You said, I got to tell my age. I'm 74. Um, and I'll take one more question. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, something about um, history, slavery history of, or in the area of Garden Prairie, yeah. Can you relate some of that to us? All right. First of all, there's only about 115 slaves. Can you repeat the question? All right. She wants to know, could I relate to something in this particular area about slavery? Oh, okay. okay. Is that correct? That's right. all right. There's only, there's only 115 slaves in, in this area when he came in in 1820, 1828. Secondly, your area, as they called it, and you'll, you're gonna love the descriptions because it talked about the people. I got old copies of magazines and Briar Roy, Rose, they do the pioneering families. And I could not find Pittman. I couldn't find Alexander or St. Charles County. And I was looking up Pittman and in it, it also had Alexander. And I repeat in volume two, the exact verbal, verbiage, uh, or statement that's in there. They put it in a year later. Now that's Providence, and this happens over and over again with me, with Providence. Question, anything else you want me to tell about slavery? You want more? You want more? Well, yes. Okay. <laughs> Are you related to her back here? Okay. She says she's not related to you. That's correct. Okay. He's a McClure. Okay. Oh, the McClures are related to the Alexanders. The McClures came in and Robert died and he came in in 1829 with uh, James Alexander and the Campbells. Yes. And he was a doctor. And they kept a diary. Yep, they the kept trip, a diary. And they kept a logbook of all the expenses. Yeah. And that exists today in my family. Well, I'm going to be around. I would love to break some bread with you. And Archibald Alexander's twin sister had a daughter who married Robert McClure. Okay. They intermarried. They rather you marry their cousin or daughter of a brother, then marry outsider. So there's a lot of intermarriage between the three or four of the families. Uh, he was doctor. Is that, he was doctor because he was 
uh, medically trained or religiously trained, you know? Medically. Medically. Dr. Uh, McClure? Yeah. And he That's, died in 18... He was a sergeant's mate in World War of 1812, probably. Uh, and he died, and his, his wife Nancy right. is the one they took back. See, if I was wrong, I'd be dead. <laughs> All right? No, his daughter was Nancy. That's right, his daughter... His daughter who, married my great-grandfather, Thomas Watson, the yeah. first pastor of Darden Presbyterian Church. Excellent. In yes. 1840. All right. She got to be 18. Well, so no, Nancy, there's a McClure who, Nancy who married McClure. James in 1820 in Virginia. And she, all, she had been married before and she had three or four children. And that, they came forth to Missouri. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You, this may be in the book, so you can skip if it is, because I'm going to get the book. Yeah. But you mentioned somebody went to Illinois and was over. Do you know the area of Illinois? Oh, yeah. It was uh, Alton. Uh, yeah. He just went over. He lived there for about two years, and they came back. Okay. That's where he bought the watch, the gold watch. Well, I was from Illinois, Richie. That's okay. And by the way, ma'am, thank you. Do we tell her thank you? That's what, what I thought we would have it. Martin Luther King Day, because we get kids out of school. Okay, yes. When were you published, and is there Jan a we, we, The official date was January 3rd, 2015. We, they, they have a, right now, the per, uh, publishing industry is going through a lot of changes. There's nine authors who are caught, and they kept promising me, and I have high priority. Is that right, Tristan? So they told me, by February 14th. Here's what we're going to do on that. Those who sign up, we have a credit card dispenser or whatever, you can even tell us what you want if you want to say it to Bill or Mary. A lot of people buy birthday gifts and all that. We will make sure you get it. We're coming back into the area. Where's the priest? We're coming back. He left. <laughs> And you guys are the fall of it. Right. <laughs> We're coming back to the area latter part of February to talk to school children. But we're going to talk about Dr. King and us, the unsung heroes of the Civil Rights Movement, and history. What makes history so... Uh, the common denominator of all my children is they went to museums and they got a lot of history. And uh, they're uh, bright children because of the competition, but they understand the history. And I, someone asked me at one of my groups about what's happening here with Ferguson. And I just said, it's not about gun control or police control, it's about self-control on both ends. All right, yes. The balance of that question was, what is the chance of getting your publications into the schools? The, the volume two, See, you've been talking, volume two, we made it so it'll fit in schools. It's based, it's very authoritative. 200 and some pages, but it talks about the trip. Uh, I go to uh, Cambridge, talk about that. It talks about slavery, but it gives us facts where it's a matter of history. And it's not a matter of victim or pointing the finger or anything else. It's about wonderful people living great lives. Any other question? Okay, Tristan, you want to get these go people going? And I'm tired, and I'll never forgive you for turning out. You are the best group I've been before in years. And let me applaud you. Okay. I know. He's not so busy.